Well, it is 1015. Time for us to begin. And uh, if you'll give me just a moment, I'll open us in prayer and then we'll be off to the races. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us. And because we are sorely hindered by our sins, let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. It seemed fitting for stave four. That's today, uh, third Sunday, and it was perfect, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know about all of you, um, but I don't know what I'm going to do when we're done with this, because Scott and I have been reading the carol to one another on Saturday evenings and, and just really enjoying it. Well, Indeed. I wonder what everybody who's been attending the class uh, will <laughs> do as well, because this has really given a lovely focus to uh, at least to the weekends. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah. For sure. I mean, at the at the end of at the end of the last session, I think Father Casey, you asked, you know, what what do you what are you thinking about talking about for the next day? But I I made a statement, and I think it was taken as a joke, but it was actually quite serious. And that is, I don't know, I haven't read it yet, right? I mean, I've read it 20 times in the past, but I haven't read it this time, you yeah. know, and, and it was, so it was, and, and yet again, when I read it this time, wonderful things came forth. So, yeah, so, um, so yeah. I thought I'd written about a 60 page chapter of this, and I don't know how I'm going to credit each of you <laughs> for every interesting thought, which is now completely blown my, my chapter away. But I'll, I'll start with a question because it's, I don't have an answer to this question. But in this fourth stave, it opens and Scrooge is fearful from the beginning. And I guess my question is both for the book and for today's sermon and this part of Advent, what, what can death teach to life? What, what are the things that viewing from beyond the grave, from that perspective, um, it can can affect life. Mm. I mean, it's a funny thing you mentioned fear, um, particularly at this one. But it, but in fact, I think from the very beginning, he's been a fearful person. Even even when Marley first comes in and he tries to make the jokes, mm -hmm. it's 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 not humorous. Right. I mean, he's trying to make the jokes to try to deal with the fear. And then finally, the fear overwhelms him. But he but even in the very for the very first page, I mean, he's been a fearful person. And so therefore, it seems to me that when he sees this spirit, he's fearful because the thing that he's fearful of, well, he's fearful of everything, but he's particularly fearful of the future. Right. Uncertainty. Right. Uh, poverty. What's going to happen? might I lose everything stuff you know and so he's been a, he's been a fearful person all the way through and therefore it's for me at least it's no surprise that he would be fearful um seeing what's coming mm -hmm. because I think, that, that, know, that has driven him all the way through but to follow up on uh, follow up on follow Casey and you I mean I think we are this time it's um it, it's you know it's not that cheery little candle like ghost of Christmas past or this enormous, you know, even if, and it was a wonderful point you guys made last week, uh, come to know me better, even if that's a challenge uh, and, and brilliantly uh, ended at the end, I, it did, I, I thought after our session last time, that boy and girl uh, could be even the infant not real, but the possibility, the degraded possibility of Scrooge and his sister as children. Oh, uh, wow. and, uh, you know, the, yeah. Because it is a boy and a girl, and it it's ignorance yeah. and want, and they both are, well, Scrooge is particularly ignorant, and then the factory and the uh, workhouse behind and all the rest of it. Anyway. Or even he and his, his ex-fiance, right, who was yeah. want. 
Yeah. Poor. And, and it's really weird in the Alistair Sim film, uh, Bell is shown in, in the fourth stage as uh, taking care of homeless people instead of having that wonderful family that was just all around her and a daughter that rep replicated her. Uh, so they really took the kind of liberties that Father Casey was talking about. Yeah. That's funny. You know, um, I thought about the, the boy from last time, ignorance, and how we together arrived at this um, understanding that to a large extent Scrooge is is ignorance incarnate. That was wonderful. Yeah. And when you play with that with come in and know me better man hmm. and these children belong to man and then here's Scrooge and he's maybe not a man maybe he's a boy maybe he hasn't grown up yet hmm. into a man. If man you be right? Yes. That doesn't yeah. That is, I think that is part of it. If yeah. man you be. Yeah. Not. As this stave opened, I couldn't help but notice that, and perhaps it does have something to do with fear, um, the spirit shows up and, and Dickens says, it was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. But for this, it would have been difficult to detach its figure from the night and separate it from the darkness by which it was surrounded. And I couldn't help but think about in the beginning when he was in the dark room and he couldn't tell the dark wall, the opaque wall from the window because it was so dark. And now you have this figure who comes in and the future is like that, right? It, 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 we see just a little glimpse of the future but we don't get to see the whole thing and we really can't distinguish. Right where it is and where it isn't. And it's even, um, there it is when, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the, my text. When, when after, the, after the old Joe scene and they're mm -hmm. taken to the bedroom where the corpse is lying on the bed, that scene is introduced with the room was very dark, too dark to be observed with any accuracy. The same exact thing that it was in the last tape at the beginning where he can't tell the difference between the window and the wall because it's so dark. Um, and so the thing that struck me throughout this whole thing is that uh, how in the heck does Scrooge not know who the corpse is? I know. It's like, dude, wake up. Jeez, don't you understand? But that's the thing, right? He doesn't. He doesn't know, right? And I was, and again, I was making my coffee this morning, sort of ruminating on things. And it's like, <clears throat> you know who Scrooge is a lot like? <clears throat> He's a lot like Roy, you know? Because um, again, I know I'm going to die, right? But yet... I live my life pretty petty sometimes and you know I get upset about things that I shouldn't get you know and so it, it's it's it, it just really struck me and that is that he seems to be so ignorant I mean in the first right in the second stage he's ignorant about his memories he's forgotten a lot of stuff in the second stage he's ignorant just about the way the world is what's going on in the world but in this one he's he's ignorant about him I mean it really is kind of a Freudian type of thing he's really is ignorant about himself and his own mortality and that's what really drives I think a lot of his demeanor uh, throughout the whole book but but it's a very peculiar bed scene if, if we leap to it um and I, if somebody wanted to read the paragraph oh cold cold rigid right till death oh. um uh, uh, it, 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 I don't know. Pull it up on the screen. Do you want me to do that? I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, right, for, for me at least, when I, when I read this thing through, right, every year, and there are certain parts of it that I completely, it's like, I've never read that before in my life. I, I, I completely skip over, you know, because there are, there are, just a, right, word of warning, right, there are things, there are whole passages, paragraphs in this that don't move the plot along. Mm -hmm. And because we're so primed in this society to read for plot, right? We watch movies, right? We're so primed for plot that we just sort of skip through that. That paragraph, that paragraph, cold, cold, rigid, dreadful death, that paragraph, I think it's the central paragraph in this whole thing. And I'd never read it before. So anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt, Bob, but I think that this paragraph is what it's all about. Somebody like to read it and then 
I can't read it because my pictures of the four of you cuts in the right hand side of the All right. page. Oh, cold, cold, rigid, dreadful death, set up thine altar here and dress it with such terrors as thou hast at thy command, for this is thy dominion. But of the loved, revered, and honored head, thou canst not turn one hair to thy dread purposes or make one feature odious. It is not that the hand is heavy and will fall down when released. It is not that the heart and pulse are still, but that the hand was open, generous, and true. The heart brave, warm, and tender, and the pulse a man's. Strike, shadow, strike, and see his good deeds springing from the wound to sow the world with life immortal. And then no voice pronounced these words in Scrooge's ears, and yet he, mm -hmm. heard he looked when he looked upon the bed. Now it isn't Scrooge. I'm sorry. The hand was not open and generous no. in life. No. We we kind of back read that that's Scrooge in in the bed. But what really confusing is that. Uh, this is Christ. Out of that wound comes the water and blood of life oh, eternal. But it, how do you implant that on Scrooge and a room where the body is being uh, sought after by rats and cats to consume? It's just, um, I need a lot of help with this, please. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Except that I understand that, again, that, you know, we, we can incorporate Christ, but Scrooge hasn't. Uh, and, and so and, and maybe it isn't Scrooge's. Uh, maybe, maybe we're the ignorant ones here. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Help. <laughs> Scrooge doesn't do that. He doesn't, he doesn't understand. He doesn't recognize what's happening throughout the whole stave until the end when he gets to the graveyard and he sees his name. There's something about seeing his name there that makes him confront truth. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going to give credit where credit is due. But when Scott woke up in the middle of the night, after having read this last night, what he told me this morning that he thought of was when we are in the church on Ash Wednesday, and we are being invited into a season of repentance, Lent. The priest says, I invite you, therefore, in the name of the church, to the observance of a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance. And Scrooge doesn't begin any self-examination until that moment. Until when? Until the moment that he sees his name on the gravestone. Yeah. There's stirrings of it, right? Oh, I wish I had said something to the boy. Oh, I, um, what is it um, today? I, he had, it had been turning in his mind that he might change his life, right? There's like, there's like intimations of it, but he never, you're absolutely right. He never repents. So, yeah. 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 It's, Bob, I'm just wondering if this is some sort of contrast of, of two of um of what is possible in death because it's contrasting um the importance is not the dead corpse the the importance is what the body had made manifest in its life um and then the next paragraph he thought if this man could be raised up now what would be his foremost thoughts avarice hard dealing mm -hmm. griping Cares. It's sort of setting, right? Isn't it setting in contrast these two possibilities? Essentially, what Scrooge has made manifest in his life with what would be or could be possible um, were life lived differently. Right. It's it, that first that again, sort of doing reader response criticism. Right. When I read it, it's like, oh, cold, cold, rigid, dreadful death. Set up thine altar here, and dress it with such terrors as thou hast at thy command, for this is thy dominion. When I get to the end of that first sentence, I think, well, of course it's thy dominion. It's a 
it's a it's a damn corpse on a bed. Of course, it's your dominion. But it's like, oh, but then you keep reading and it's like, in fact, the way in which death should be is that it's not actually the, 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 the dominion of death. This guy, this guy, whoever's under this guy, this is the dominion of death. And in fact, spoiler alert, it's been the dominion of death from the very first state. It's, it's not just now that he's dead. He's been dead throughout the whole thing <clears throat> in various types of ways. But what we get is that this, 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 this openness, this generosity doesn't, that actually undermines death. It actually brings about immortality in the world. Because if you're, right, if the guy is brought up and what's his going to be his foremost thoughts, avarice, hard dealing, griping cares, oh, they have certainly brought him to a rich end, truly. That's the next sentence, right? They have brought him to a rich end. Rich, right? Again, obviously it's sarcastic, but it's kind of interesting is that those types of things should bring him to a rich end because avarice, griping, grasping, you get lots of stuff. But in fact, it's not rich. Obviously, it's not rich at all. It's and, actually poverty. So, and of course, the previous scene with Joe in the uh, old old place has seen the result of all that richness. I mean, it, the beginning stave has Scrooge making a it, undoubted bargain on the the death of Marley, and here we've got the undoubted bar uh, uh, benefits being made. Uh, after Scrooge's death, or yes, Scrooge's death. Uh, but at the beginning, it talks of this uh, uh, paragraph, thy, set up thine altar here. And um, it, 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 as we know, uh, the, Jesus was buried in a, a kind of cave uh, with a stone across the surface of it, the entrance to it. But in the Renaissance, that's often portrayed as a kind of sarcophagus and with the lid slipped down on it and Christ rising or in some other location within the frame of the picture. And is it right that the altar itself is both a kind of representation of the Last Supper and of, the, I, I don't, I'm not a specialist enough to know if it's also the burial place. So if it is, then we have a scene where this is a lot more than a bed, a lot more than a bed in, in Scrooge's chamber. Mm. It's really a merge. It, people were worried about how many days we were going through. Well, this is an a, a overlay of, of uh, the, 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 highest, the highest death the world has ever known and our ordinary deaths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Wow. Is that right? Is that close at all? Is that stupidly read? I don't know. No, I don't think that's wrong, no. wrong at all. And, and actually, coming back to the theme of the class, you know, weaving what we understand to be themes of Advent into this, um, I, whether Dickens was aware of it or not, most likely not, um, nevertheless, that theme is certainly pulling, that thread is pulling through um, quite poignantly in this moment. There's also, I, so we, we, once you have the text up there, Mother Rebecca, once you have the text up there, I just go crazy because I love text. <laughs> but but it's, it's funny because right after this, right, because the, the, the spirit keeps pointing to the head. Um, I understand you, Scrooge returned, mm -hmm. and I would do it if I could, but I have not the power spirit. I have not the power. And Mother Rebecca, you brought this up a bazillion years ago about the whole notion of power yeah. and, the, and powerlessness and who's really powerless in this story. And it's Scrooge who's powerless. Um, and at least now uh, he knows it. Exactly. He admits it, right? which again, may be the first part of repentance. Right? Well, the, the flip of this, of course, is that this corpse on this bed if it's transfigured into uh, the body of Christ, had all the power in death. It was the death that, what, what's our colic today? The, the, the death that um, overturned death? Uh, this is one of the readings this morning. Uh, so it's, I, the, the, the mashup is wonderful. If, if, if it theologically, you, you guys could say that even a Scrooge has this potential, but I, I don't know if it's 
sentimental or confused or really um, what each one of us, if we're all Scrooges, has the potential to be. I think that's one of the overriding themes of the entire, right? Nothing wonderful can come of this. You have to understand that Marley was dead or else nothing wonderful can come from this. And that's the whole point. And again, right, just like you said, you, this overlay of Scrooge and Christ, and how does that relate to us? Well, I think it, it there, there isn't a thing that we talked about this for these four weeks that doesn't apply to us, right? The, the, that's the wonderful thing about literature. So yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a, the scene that follows, the two scenes that follow fascinate me. Scrooge looks up and asks, is there any person in the town who feels emotion caused by this man's death? And, and where is he taken immediately? He's taken to the home of a couple who rejoices in his That's right. Yeah, that's right. It, it, isn't that are so, are so polite. They're so polite that they rejoice um, very uh, hesitantly. <laughs> they know repentance. They, they're self-examining and they <laughs> repent <laughs> even as they rejoice. rejoice right. <laughs> but it does start out oddly. Is it good, she said, or bad That's to right. help him? Yeah. Bad, he yeah. answered. I mean, they're not dismissing the fact of death, mm -hmm. uh, but it's the fact that this death releases life for them. Uh, it's that debt that can now be repaid, which it couldn't be if the Scrooge were still alive or the creditor was still alive. Hey, I think it's even, there's something else going on here, right? Um, the phantom spread its dark robe before him for a moment like a wing and withdrawing it revealed a room by daylight where a mother and her children were, stopping right there. Who is this? Who do I think this is? We've seen a room before with a mother, children going crazy, playing. We've seen this before, right? This is Belle. This is Belle and her children. That's what I'm expecting. Obviously it's not, I'm not saying it is, obviously it's not, but that's what we're expecting. So show me someone whose death this has actually affected. Oh, well, the, the long lost fiance who, what, you know, maybe, maybe she's, but obviously it's not, it's not Belle. And so for me, at least, it's just, I, I think it's so wonderful that it's, it's tempting. It, the, the, the narrator here is like tempting us to think, oh, well, maybe, maybe, but it's not. Even Belle, even Belle doesn't care. Nobody cares. Um, it's so, a yeah, man yeah. and his wife, Carol. Oh. <laughs> yes, that's true. Carol, oh, I didn't get that. <laughs> Nothing like a close reader. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, that's lovely. Yeah. But the, the oh. other part then is that the hope, the miracle is, the miracle is double, that, that, the, that the person who, to whom you owe the debt will transfer that debt to someone else who will be understanding and kind and good. Um, and uh, the miracle is, is the time, the time to change, mm -hmm. the time that will allow them to have the change themselves uh, and, and she has children. And I'm just thinking today of the applicability. We should read this aloud to our families because of all the people who are threatening, threatened with losing their apartments of, you know, on the 1st mm -hmm. of January. Uh, mm -hmm. Here it is. Um, it, it's just as pertinent as it could possibly be. The miracle for the couple is time but even as they acknowledge that miracle of time to gather the money to pay, and certainly the creditor will be better, they acknowledge that Scrooge has run out of time. Yeah. Mm. Now, so he goes through this scene, show me someone, so show me some emotion connected with this man's death. This is what he gets. And he then says to the spirit, let me see some tenderness connected with a death. Okay. Any, any death will do. <laughs> before, before we go to the Cratchits, before yeah. we go to the Cratchits, can we jump back just a little bit and talk about Old Joe? Sure. That, that scene because we, yeah. we sort of skipped over it because there's something for me at least, particularly in light of what we just saw, particularly in light of Caroline and her husband and her kids and the relief that they get from Scrooge's death. The whole and again, I don't want to go into it 
long if we, unless we want to. But right at the end of that whole thing with old Joe, right, and the charwoman and the laundress and the undertaker's man, and they're they've made a killing. Ha ha ha. Pun intentional. They made a killing after after uh, Scrooge's death. The way in which Scrooge sees this, Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror as they sat grouped around their spoil in the scanty light afforded by the old man's lamp, he viewed them with a detestation and a disgust, which could hardly have been greater, though they had been obscene demons marketing the corpse itself. The thing is, after the next scene, is that there's no difference between these three and Scrooge. They all do the same thing. They all make money off of our poor, unfortunate, whatever. Scrooge himself, in the way in which he, his whole life is done, is his whole life is done with scrooging people out of their stuff, right? Just like these three, just like mm -hmm. the charwoman. And so, for the first time. It, he, he never, he keeps expecting, I, and this would be an interesting thing to go back and reread it. He keeps expecting to see himself, a shadow of himself. He keeps expecting to see that. And it very well may be that he does in this scene by seeing these, these, three, these three characters who the way in which they live their lives are exactly the same way that he lives his life. And that's ultimately why he is so disgusted? Yes. Mm. In the Alistair Sim film, it opens with Scrooge walking through the marketplace that by the change, and a debtor comes to him and says, I just can't pay anything, I can't pay anything. And Scrooge just says, too bad, you know, that's it, your time is up. So they added that at the very beginning to sort of indicate that Scrooge has no care for uh, any property but his own, which takes us. I, and now, after we get to the <laughs> Cratchit scene, I want to talk about the next scene after that. <laughs> well, the, the old Joe scene, I mean, it's essentially, I don't, I didn't count words, but it is maybe the longest scene in the, in the whole thing. Yeah, um, it's I mean, this often is, skipped. I'm sorry? It's often skipped in, in uh, you know, yeah. tellings of this story. And yeah. several of the cinematic depictions skip it because I think it, it, it uh, again, it slows them down from the sort of uh, they're trying to drive the plot along, and this seems to sort of just drive it to a halt. And it's not about Scrooge. And it's, it's not, not about Scrooge, but it is about Scrooge actually. So yeah. And yet Dickens clearly invests um, a, quite a lot of time in developing the scene in these characters. I mean, these these three figures um, uh, get almost as much time as as the as the Cratchits virtually. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I do, I think it's such an essential scene in, um, I, I think it's some of his best, I mean, the, the writing in it is so, is so marvelous. The ways were foul and narrow, the shops and houses wretched, the pe people half naked, drunken, slipshod, ugly, alleys and archways like so many cesspools, disgorge their offenses of smell and dirt and life upon the straggling streets and the whole quarter reeked with crime, with filth and misery. Yep. Can't get better than that. I mean, that's just amazing. <laughs> that's just, I mean, you can smell it. I mean, it's just, yeah. Well, it's just and, and they almost do because uh, back to Roy's point much earlier in our talks about what Scrooge has, he, he, he doesn't spend a lot on, on things. Right. Um, and so the, the, what he owns at his death, apart from the debts that others owe, uh, is, you know, they, 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 they're scared about the bed curtains. Are they infected about the fact that his shirt has been removed from his body? I mean, you can smell this. You can, uh, wh where were we with the AIDS, uh, you know, thing until Princess Diana held a kid in her arms. Mm -hmm. We believe that all that things that touched were contaminated. And so it, it's, it's, it's Scrooge's stuff isn't really very much, 
uh, and it goes into this fetid environment, you know, where it becomes uh, stuff for sale. It's declassé, de <laughs> absolutely, mm -hmm. and and smelly and dirty and awful. And it's the products of his body and its disease. Um, and there's no resurrection in those bits and pieces and cufflinks and stuff that, and that's also when I, you know, I cleared up my father's house and there were his cufflinks and there were things that, that, that I mean, lots of things it didn't matter about, but the cufflinks seemed to me to have yeah. a different sort of presence. Uh, yeah, so Dickens has got it in the details it, uh, yeah. of emotion mm -hmm. as well. And what all, all three of you have been talking about is how emotional this story is in so many ways. Uh, okay, shut up. <laughs> and, and, uh, one more thing and then we can move on. Um, so uh, minimal, so um, paltry is the hall for these three uh, that even now Scrooge still doesn't know it's him because there, he has nothing that signifies himself. There is oh. nothing left of him oh. that is unique to him. It oh. is just blah, you know, it's bedclothes and a shirt. There's nothing um, about his, what remains from him that would tell anyone that it had anything to do with his life. That's mm -hmm. beautiful. And, th th and this line that Mother Rebecca has up, um, this is another one of my favorite lines in the whole thing. Upon the floor within were piled up heaps of rusty keys, nails, chains, hinges, files, scales, weights, and refuse iron of all kinds. And the reason why I love that is that long time ago, <laughs> way back there in save one, um, uh, when Marley appears, it was made for Scrooge observed it closely of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, heavy purses wrought in steel. What we're seeing in a sense, what we're seeing in old Joe's is Marley, Marley resurrected, you know, yet again. Um, this is, this is, this is, this is hell, right? So this is beautiful. Mm. <laughs> um, as we get into the Cratchits and, and coming back, Roy, to something you said earlier, I, I have been struck um, in my pastoral ministry by the surprise experience of burying more than a few people, and it's always men, it's always men, who um, were well into their 70s and 80s and left no will, no instructions about their, um, their estate or their remains, uh, pretended right until their last breath that they were not going to die and lived in a sort of permanent state of oblivion about it or will, willful oblivion. Um, and, and here Scrooge is, is maneuvering through this future, through this yet to come and expecting to see himself at any time, right? Because of course he's going to be alive. Clearly he will be somewhere um, and refusing to um, comprehend the possibility, the, the inevitability that, um, that the dead guy is him, that he, you know, no, nobody makes it out alive. So um, I, I'm just struck, you know, pastorally from having had that experience more than once. So, I mean, Scrooge is not a caricature or if he is a caricature, he is he is emblematic of something mm -hmm. that frankly continues to happen with um, a sort of tragic regularity. Yeah, that's beautiful. There's a wonderful definition of myth. Myth is an event that never happens and is always happening. Mm -hmm. and that's yeah. isn't that wonderful? That's true. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, you you guys are so. Uh, on tar. The other thing about this this particular stave is it is filled with the with eating again, uh, repletions of various kinds. But compared to the Ghost of Christmas Present and all those winking onions and stuff, this is all horrible stuff. It's all the, the deterioration of life in the graveyard where we'll get to maybe today. Um, it's it's just rank rank with growth, but it's the the, the growth of death, uh, not the there's growth one, of there's life. One eating, so, there's one eating uh, reference. There's one eating reference. It's not like that. Um, I don't mind going if lunch is provided, observed <laughs> the gentleman with the excrusions on his nose, but I must be fed if I make one. So, that's, so there's the, right, so. I, 
But look at his body and look at his value. (laughs) Feeding feeding a gross thing, you know? The cat and the rat will love that body. Mm. You know, it's so fascinating that um, there's these echoes across the different spirits of one another, the eating, et cetera. Um, I'm struck by in the past, in Ghost of Christmas past and Ghost of Christmas present, there's this um, rapidity. They're hurtling from place to place. They're mm-hmm. flying through the air. Uh, they're um, uh, flying through the village and he's vi- revisiting his childhood. And then, and then there's this like instantaneous f- flash to the next scene. And then in the Ghost of Christmas present, they're like literally soaring over the ocean out past lighthouses and stuff. There's this speed. Um, and in future, though he visits a number of scenes, a, a number of different um, uh, ex, uh, moments, it feels um, like sl- it, everything is ponderously slow, like the ghost is moving slowly and his hand is moving slowly and everything is moving with this slow speed, which is to me a sort of juxt- this weird juxtaposition of the way it feels like the future is constantly hurtling at me and the past is sort of, I'm sort of stuck repeating it. Um, and yet Dickens has sort of playfully inversed that in the way that he moves Dickens, uh, uh, moves Scrooge through it. And say that I, again. Say, I'm sorry, Father Casey. Could say that, say that again, what you just said at the very end. Well, the, the juxtaposition. Yeah. So the, the, in my in my personal experience as a um, just in life, it feels like the future is constantly hurtling at me, like it's the thing that I'm flying flying into, and the past is just something I sort of am stuck playing over and over in my mind, um, and revisiting again and again. And yet that that Dickens has sort of inversed that or juxtaposed it in the way that he carries Scrooge through them. And I don't really know what to do with that other than to observe it and to try to sort of like ponder over it. Um, why it is that the fu- spirit of the future is the one who moves the slowest. There's also, a, 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 for me at least, an interesting thing that between the past and the future, and that is in the past, we, we, the first thing we saw was Scrooge as a little boy. Then we saw Scrooge, and again, I think uh, Bob made a reference to this about every seven years, but they were seven years in order, right? And, but in this one, in the future, I, I, it explicitly says is that the, it's, it's just the future. There's no, there's no chronology. There's no order here. It's just scenes going back and forth. And obviously the last one is of, a, of the grave that's been overgrown and obviously that's the last one but all of these scenes up to up to that in this stave are just sort of we're not quite sure is w- which one comes first which one comes second i mean chronologically and we're not and so there's that as well you know uh, oh, w- which is which is important because yet again yet again spoiler alert um is that this this future is in fact not set um and so, therefore, there there isn't any chronology because it's it's actually by, by the end of that stave, it has fallen apart. There's the scene uh, where where the spirit is pointing the hand, which is all you can see, toward the head on the table, imploring Scrooge to pull back the sheet, and he says, "I have not the power." And Scrooge describes the the hand as it's it's trembling. It's and 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 that's we talked about this this morning as well that the, the future is is tremulous we don't know one way or the other and it's it wavers okay. right um the, the things are all liminal in a sense uh we we, mm-hmm. we we have the body that's not buried yet we have the funeral that hasn't happened yet we have the selling off of the things in the in the house before the house is even closed um it's 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 really transition time but still gets closer, closer to both the miracle of a death mm-hmm. and the fact of this particular death. And maybe it's all again in the Cratchit family because it, it took me years to understand that Tiny Tim is dead upstairs. Right. I mean, yes. in that room. Right. Uh, and when, when Bob says that he's been to see that it's the green, there are lovely green trees there. He means the plot where Tim will be buried, but we haven't got there yet. We haven't consigned him dust to dust. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
yet. Uh, it's it's. Well, anyway, <laughs> it's, I mean, it, for me, at least, this scene makes me uncomfortable and not uncomfortable dealing with Tiny Tim and his death, but just uncomfortable chronologically trying to make sense of these various little conversations. Mm -hmm. um, th th this one sort of, for me, at least, I, I can understand each and every paragraph. But then when I try to put it together, it gets a little it gets I told him that I would be visiting on Sundays. You know, and so it, it, again, it's just it, it's. Well, and how kind Fred has already expressed himself to be, uh, and you know, going to help the family and and so forth, and find a place for Peter. Um, it it uh, it's it's past and present and future. It's it's yeah, it's it's, it's doing that past, present, future of the future sort of all together and suspended. It's yeah. not exactly happening yet. You yeah. Know? And Scrooge is there, but he's only there through someone else. He's only there through his nephew. Yeah, Fred, notice Fred shows up to express condolences and um, support to the Cratchit family. Though Scrooge's death, Fred is nowhere to be seen. Um, mm -hmm. I find that really. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, Father Casey, do we assume that Fred is able to be so generous because he's often been a spendthrift because Scrooge either didn't write a will and he inherited or did write a will and he inherited and it's sort of neither of those possibilities for Scrooge seems real I mean surely would want all of these things uh, at least the debts to be somehow or other if, unless he just could face death as Father Casey said I mean yeah. Gosh, you guys unpack a lot in this. Thank you. <laughs> There's a wonderful moment in the um, uh, um, Disney uh, animated version where Cratchit is going up the stairs. And it's one of the only ones that I saw where uh, Tiny Tim is actually upstairs, where Cratchit is going upstairs to see Tiny Tim. Yes, right. Eliminated. And actually in some of the other ones, um, you, see a gra you see a gravestone and Tiny Tim is there. Or there's like a crutch or something. There's like a nod to Tiny Tim, but he is not in the house. But in this, um, the Jim Carrey animated version, Tim is up in the, in the bed and Cratchit is going up, ascending the stairs and Scrooge is sitting on the stairs observing the scene. Yes. And as Cratchit goes up the stairs, he pauses in his grief and is collecting oh. himself and is face to face with Scrooge. And in a way that I marvel at the way that they were cap able, able to capture the emotion of this in an animated motion capture way, the, the convulsion of Scrooge's face as the full like enormity of what Cratchit is experiencing finally occurs to Scrooge and he has a moment of revelation of what is actually transpiring emotionally. And it is a devastating three seconds of movie just in this sort of, um, not in the story, but in this way that it's been depicted, they come face to face, though they, though Cratchit does not actually see him. Yeah, that's, oh. that's a great moment in that film, yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, it's gut wrenching, and you know, I've I've heard from uh from from folks who've been attending the class who talk about how this is you know one of the real tearjerker um, moments in all of liter you know English literature, and it, it truly is a heartbreaking scene, and um, doesn't need much extra enhancement to play up its um, heartstrings, mm -hmm. but um, uh, yeah, it is it is such a such a sad sad scene. The color hurts my eyes, Mrs. Cratchit says. And I've been to two ophthalmologists and asked them, you know, going back to what's Tiny Tim's real disease? <laughs> okay, what's bothering her eyes? And one gave me a very learned explanation about the different wavelengths and the different illumination, ambient illumination, and how it would be harder for blue to get through and there'd be more strain. And the other said, She's just hiding the fact that she's crying. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> so, because she's working on something, right? She's sewing. Yes. Her, she and her daughters are engaged in sewing. Yeah. And the color of whatever it is they're working on hurts her eyes. Maybe she's crying. But um, then a little bit later, it's, it says something about the work That's that something. she's working on will be done by Sunday, Sunday. which That's leads right. me to believe he's going to be buried on Sunday in whatever it is she's sewing. Humoral. 
Yeah. The reason the reason why the color hurts her eyes is because it's black, right? And it's hard to sew black, right? Uh, because uh, it's the more it's the morning clothes, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to find that part. Tenants is the proverbial. Uh, oh, don't you know? I'm just chopping onions here. That's right. Exactly. But the color hurts my eyes. That's why I'm crying. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. They would be done long before Sunday. You see. Yeah. This, this Mrs. Cratchit and the girls all sewing those mm -hmm. garments. Those garments, yeah. As, as compared with what we saw earlier, yes. Uh, Rouge's shirt for being buried in, and, the, and they hold it up and say, There's not a hole in it anywhere. It's perfect. <laughs> and he could be buried in calico. That's not a problem. Yeah, that's exactly. Right. Oh. <laughs> oh, the the last shirt Scrooge wears is taken from him because no one loves him or cares about him. And here, Tim's loving family is making by hand mm. the last thing that they can adorn Tim. And it's just a, a, a lovely contrast. The whole scene is just be careful what you ask for, Scrooge, right? Show me some emotion connected with a death. Yeah. And the stark contrast is just, it's gut-wrenching. The scene doesn't, the scene is harder for us in right in 2020 to interpret because, of course, the minute someone dies, someone comes in and takes that body away and um, removes that body from our sight and, uh, and does things with it. And of course, in, in you know, um, early Victorian England, um, as it would have been down through history, the, the body would not have been taken really anywhere until it was taken to its final resting place. And- uh, Family so would wash it and do all that with it. Mm -hmm. I, when my stepfather died, he was in home uh, hospice and the wonderful woman that was treating him uh, helped but began to take him out. And she turned to us and she said, do you want his eyes open or closed? And I said, he was always looking and curious in his life, leave them open. So he can see. I mean, you just, you go into these strange liminal states yourself about death uh, and whether the person is still alive in some way. Anyway, well, and then we get to the... Uh, yeah, our parting moment is at hand, so let's not skip this last scene. <laughs> All I want to say about this interim scene is they go through the places where Scrooge lived. I mean, his counting house and his home. And what's fascinating about that little detail is they're not his anymore. Mm -hmm. And it raises again, as with the first scene or the second scene in this stave, that you don't own anything. Home forever and ever isn't, doesn't exist. And then you come to the gravestone. And here we have to think about all the kinds of stones that have been present in this, from the hearthstone, that petrification of a hearth in Scrooge's uh, chambers, and Peter, and upon this rock I will build your church, and don't have a heart of adamant and, and then Roy said something a, a week or two ago, quoting, I think it's just Isaiah, but I'm not sure, Ezekiel, about, yeah. I will change your heart of stone to a heart of flesh. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That's right. So here's the heart of stone. And it's a, it's a stone with writing on it. Now that's also lithography. And when Dickens edited the Daily News a, a year later, one of the things he says is, I was sitting there by the stone on which the paper is printed. So he was very conscious of lithography, mm -hmm. which makes sense out of Scrooge's saying, wipe off <laughs> this carving, but it's carved into the stone. That's what you say about stones. It's carved in stone. Okay. Uh, and, but, but this idea of wiping off is the idea of a, a writer who knows about lithography. So it, again, it's just one of those themes that runs through and all the changes that Dickens is able to make. And uh, whoever cut this particular woodcut, um, which was a woodcut and not a stone cut, but the Z is reversed on the Ebenezer. If you look at it very closely, the Z is backwards. <laughs> So is it really his stone? Oh, <laughs> wow. That's brilliant. No, it wasn't me, but uh, it's just weird. I, I assume it's a mistake, but, but, but people were reversing 
lettering in, in, you know, that's one of the things you have to do when you're doing a reverse image. Um, but that to me is, that's beautiful. Yeah. Or, or perhaps there is no one who cares enough uh, to pay attention to the stone and its lettering because yeah. there's no one there. I mean, who, who would show up to the stonemason and say, you've gotten it wrong? That's right. No one's left to care. That's right. Well, the, the other thing that, again, Roy, one of you all could talk more about is the name Ebenezer. We haven't really talked about that first name yet, but it was the name of the Stone of Hope. Right. Stone of help. Battle? Yeah. Stone of help. That's right. Stone of help. In uh, First Samuel. Yeah. And so, uh, after a famous battle, <clears throat> this is in First Samuel seven. Don't try this at home. I'm a professional. So in First Samuel seven, uh, there's a battle. Uh, they obviously uh, Israelites win the battle, uh, and um, Samuel takes a stone and sets it up as a memorial of the battle and calls it Ebenezer, which means stone of help, because he says, God has helped us to this point, which is really neat, particularly here at the end of the fourth stave, because up to this, even though Ebenezer would not have seen it this way, up to this point, God has been his help. God has helped him up to this point. Mm -hmm. And therefore, stave five is gonna be remarkably, remarkably different mm -hmm. from all the other ones. There was just a flash of somebody saying something on screen I, that one of our audience. Just people noticing various things. Oh, okay. okay. The, the, one of my favorite moments about the, the parts of, of this particular moment of this stave is um, he keeps, um, he is this cry, right? That Scrooge makes to the, to the spirit um, is this, which is always played up so wonderfully in all the, cinematic depictions and state depictions as well is this spirit is this what will happen or what may happen and what i love is that the spirit just keeps pointing at the grave <laughs> because the answer to the question is this is going to happen right. like um i'm sorry but this is gonna happen that's right um and of course the spirit doesn't speak. So you don't get any of the nuance of, you know, and, and of course we, we can are left to imagine in stage five that his transformation does perhaps lead to a different outcome, but- Not that one. Exactly. Not, not that outcome. Exactly, yeah. yes. He's still looking for a way out. That's right. And it's like, nope, there's no way out. No way out. But the other thing about why that spirit is voiceless all the way through the other four staves, there have been voices unidentified or the, that, how did he hear that? But he said a child before them. I mean, maybe that's what somebody was reading when he got into the Cratchit room. Um, there are all these echoes there again, they're part of the, of the oral linguistic framework that surrounds this, this text. Um, but this, this is just, in a funny kind of way, this is fact. This is death. This is dead. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there are things beyond death, but this is death. And what Scrooge says is, I want a different life before this end. I am not the man I was. I will keep the past, the present, and the future in my heart. Now, again, we a little skeptical about what Unitarians were preaching at this time. Although I'm told you, Roy, I think you said it that, that or no, it was Father Casey who said the Unitarians were closer to the Anglican worship uh, in the 19th century than they are today. So, I mean, if, if this, this kind of advent was present in the Unitarian church and Dickens took a, a pew and was there for a decade uh, and was very close to a couple of Unitarian ministers as well, and invited one of them to attend a reading of the Christmas, the next Christmas book. Um, then this past, present, and future is making Scrooge into that body of Christ we saw in the bed just a few episodes mm. before. Is that is that possible? Mm. I mean, not making him. <laughs> he's not the new Christ. This is, <laughs> but. But that potential, potentially things in this in this life, 
better, to bring heaven on earth with enough. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's interesting at the end, right? Yeah, the, the finger was at there. Spirit, he cried, tight clinging at his robe. And again, Mother Rebecca brought this up about the clinging of right, the woman. Uh, hear me. I am not the man I was. And I love this sentence. I will not be the man I must have been. Boy, diagram that sentence, if you will. <laughs> uh, I will not be the man I must have been, but for this intercourse. C because, right, I mean, the way we play with these types of things in our own head, I mean, like personally, is that either the future is totally open or it's totally set, right? There's either predestination or there's not predestination. We can do whatever we want or it's, we, we can't do anything except what God already, quote unquote, God already knows. But it's not like that. There are some things that are inevitable. Again, Father Casey, I mean, you brought up several cases of people who went to the, their dying breath thinking that they weren't going to die. And I can tell you, if you lead your life that way, that's the way it's going to go. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, it's predetermined. But yet there is a freedom, right? And so the, it's, it's neither either or. I will not be the man I must have been, but for this intercourse, why show me this if I am past all hope? Mm -hmm. And for the first time, the hand appeared to shake. It's like it, suddenly that, that future is falling apart. Um, it, it's, 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 it's disintegrating, right? The future that he's shown him. It's, it's in fact, not the way it's going to be. Um, so. so death is both the end and the way to teach you to change mm -hmm. in life. Is that is that right? Is Absolutely. That? I think mean, that th there's a great book that's about that. I think Bob. Uh, it's called A Christmas Carol. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that comes after Revelation in the New Bible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, oh and and I, I mean that sort of brings us uh, that comment. Roy brings us to the end of the state, right? Just, just one more, just one more at the very end. Yeah, um, that's your, your nature. Um, I'm sorry, good, good spirit. Just think, right? I mean, this creepy good spirit he pursued as down upon the ground he fell before it. Your nature intercedes for me. Your nature pities me. Assure me that I may yet change these shadows that you have shown me by an altered life. Mm -hmm. The kind mm -hmm. hand trembled. Mm -hmm. Kind. This has been, he's, he's been thinking, and we think of this as sort of the grim reaper or some sort of horrific, but no, this has actually been kindness. Um, so anyway, kind hand trembled. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite lines in the whole book. And I will just add that Mother Rebecca has been teaching us about the collects and that the beginning of the collect is the name of the Lord and it's a different adjective. And <laughs> here the spirit is kind spirit. Even before you go further, it's almost a collect introducing mm -hmm. uh, the power of the spirit defined in a new way. Very nice. Thank you guys. Which leads Scrooge <sighs> into prayer, holding up his hands in one last prayer to have his fate reversed. He saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Beautiful. The prayer, Beautiful. the prayer of repentance puts an end to that future. Gosh, gosh. <laughs> we have a very patient questioner. I think I know, I know what my answer to this would be, but, but Bob, I'll, I'll let you answer this one. Would Dickens have known what Ebenezer meant? I don't know the oh, answer to that question. I think so. Um, I, think so. I don't know I what so. was taught in the various, he, he went to a Baptist church as a kid. Uh, he, he knew Unitarian ministers in Boston, but that was a short visit. You, you all think he knew? Or yeah. Well, think what's the likelihood that you would name this character Ebenezer? Well, it's, it's a, a nonconformist name that's used in a lot of, I think, 17th and 18th, 19th century families. I, I, I think, 
it, it, we don't use it now, but I have a feeling it was around more then. But again, I don't know that they knew. It seems to me that um, it's, it's a name like, uh, oh, I don't know, Isaac or Israel or, um, right? That, that tells you something about the character. Um, just one thing, come thou fount of every, I'm looking, I'm not, I'm actually looking on my screen, come thou fount of every blessing, right, in the third stanza, now I raise my Ebenezer, and again, uh, the, come thou fount of every blessing written in 1758, um, so um, that hymn was very popular, um, and again, it's kind of funny, I think that in 1758, when you sung, now I raise my Ebenezer, people would know what you're talking about. Now, when you say, now I raise my Ebenezer, it's like people have no idea what you're talking about, so. Or being yeah. dirty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, so. One stave left. <laughs> a very different one. Yeah. Indeed. Well, there is a second ending to the carol that people don't know and don't read. Huh? Like the Gospel of Mark. <laughs> <laughs> what a cliffhanger. Oh my God. Uh, are, are you going to share? You know, we're all just stupefied. Is that online? There's the ending that you have re read in your own heart. Ah. And, oh. Well, Roy's already offered that to us. It's, it's not about the reclamation of Scrooge. No, it's about me. Yeah. And about society, right? And again, Father Casey brings this up every week, and it's so important. And that is that when you see want and ignorance, yeah, 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 you should do something about it. But in fact, we should be doing something about it. So the history of this book through the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s mm -hmm. was set by Edmund Wilson, who said that Scrooge and Dickens were bipolar and this transformation would occur for one night and he would go back to being Scrooge the next day. And it ushered in four decades of Freudian analysis of Dickens and his relationships to all the people in his life uh, and to seeing Scrooge as just a sentimental you know, transformation for a day. So that was the second ending. I wonder how Edmund Wilson died. <laughs> that a stick of holly through his heart. <laughs> Sorry. Probably in a, he's probably entombed in a, a cemetery much like the one in the picture. Exactly. Margot Habibi asks, and, and I'm not sure we have time to reflect on this today, but maybe I'll leave it as a question that we can all be thinking about. In the scene in which they divide Scrooge's clothing, is that intended to evoke the crucifixion of Christ? Oh, yes. So, I mean, lots of questions can be asked. Who knows, really? Um, but, um, but they do. They do, uh, mm -hmm. don't they? They, they, they gamble. Right. The there are book. lots of there are lots of little things that evoke scripture throughout the entire carol. Right. Yes. The touching the hem, potentially the dividing of clothing. There, there's so many of those. And and the thing with I'm sorry to keep blathering on, but the thing <laughs> with allusions is that they not only set up parallels, they also set up contrasts. Mm -hmm. So yeah. As I say, there are many endings to the carol. <laughs> <laughs> Well, friends, this has just been delightful again. Thank you. Uh, I already can't wait for next Sunday. Uh, have a wonderful week to you, to all three of you, and to everyone watching. Thank you for joining us. This yeah. is the proof that the future is rushing at you, Father Dave. <laughs> <laughs> You're having it tomorrow. Indeed. <laughs> Christmas happens tomorrow. No, really. <laughs> Although, when, when we meet with everyone next week on Sunday, we will have already... <laughs> we'll have, must have then. We, yeah. we will have already uh, lived through Christmas. Did it all in one night. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yes. Very much coming up. <laughs> all, right. all right, friends. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. <laughs>